Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 14th chapter, beginning of the 22nd verse. Hear now these words. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. And by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking towards them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind and became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, when one reads Scripture, one cannot help but count the promises to us. A person once wondered how many promises are in the Bible. And he started doing some Googling for that. You can Google things now, they say. And he found answers anywhere from 3,000 to 30,000. Now, the 30,000 is probably a bit high as there are only 31,000 verses in the Bible. But there's a person who actually counted them. It is in the book, All the Promises in the Bible by Herbert Lockyer, he tells of a man named Everett R. Storms, a Canadian school teacher. See, school teachers, they, they do some good things every now and then. They do a lot of good things. But he decided that during one of his readings, he would write down all the promises. He would journal them. And this was his 27th time of reading through the Bible. So he journaled them, and it took him about a year and a half to go through the Bible this time to compile his list. And it included 7,487 promises of God to humanity. And from one person to another person, there were 991. And God the Father to God the Son, there were two. And from a person to God, there were 290. And then there were several other combinations of promises, including nine made by Satan. But in all, storms found 8,810 promises in the Bible which kind of shows you that you can't read very long before you hear a promise. And yet, do we believe them? Do we trust in them? Or are we kind of like this couple who we, we say things and, and we'll believe them only as long as they're true to us? A photographer was telling this story about a young man who came in and he wanted a duplicate copy of a picture of his girlfriend. And he said he could do that. And when he was making the copy, he flipped it over and he saw there was an inscription on the back. And the inscription read, My dearest Tom, I love you with all my heart. I love you more and more each day. I will love you forever and ever. I am yours for all eternity. Signed, Diane. And then he looked at the bottom and there was a little P.S., and the P.S. read, if we ever break up, I want this photo back. As I said, do we really believe the promises, the words we hear? And this is a question that has an impact on us, on our faith. Do we believe? And that's where we kind of struggle sometimes. Do we believe these promises? Someone once noted that faith isn't an either or, either you have faith or you don't have. It's more where are you on the spectrum of here is no faith and here is complete faith. And I think for most of us, we'd say, well, one day I'm here and one day I'm here, and it's kind of a mixture through life. 
And we kind of see this sometimes in people's response in Scripture. I love the man's response when Jesus asked him about his son. Do you believe I can heal him? And the man's response, I believe, help my unbelief. I think he was crying out what many of us do at some point in our lives. I'm believing, but Lord, there's a part of me that needs help. Philip Yancey said that faith means trusting in advance what only makes sense in reverse. Well, our gospel lesson this morning is one of those well-known stories in the Bible one in which, you've, if you've been in church any kind of time, you've probably heard several sermons on this. There's something that captures our imagination. Peter actually walking on the water. A human doing the impossible. And it all began with Jesus completing another amazing fact. The feeding of the 5,000. See, that was the event that just happened the day before. And it was a long, hectic day. Jesus had been teaching for hours. Crowds had come from all over the place. And it was getting late in the day. And Jesus wanted to kind of mess with his disciples because that's what he does with us. He kind of messes with us to, so we can grow in our faith. And the disciples are saying, send them off to get something to eat. And Jesus says, no, you guys feed them. And they're like, that's impossible. And yet, they fed 5,000 and had food left over. And this is where our scripture picks up, that Jesus told his disciples to get in the boat and go on across the Sea of Galilee, and that he would dismiss the crowds. And if you've ever been, I've been to the Sea of Galilee there, and it's, it's, not a, it's a big lake. It's four and a half miles across and about seven miles long. So if someone's you know, going across on a boat, you can in a day easily walk around the outside edge and catch them, especially in that time period where everyone was used to walking. So they probably didn't think anything of it that they were going on. And the next day, Jesus would catch up with them. And Jesus stayed behind to pray and to have some alone time with God. And we read the disciples have gotten a good way out, but they're kind of stalled. They're battling the wind, battling one of these storms that have come up. And in some translations of the Bible, when you read it, you realize that it's the fourth watch. And Jesus is now taking the shortcut across the Sea of Galilee by walking on the water. And it's interesting that it's the fourth watch of the night. This is the last watch. It's, it's between three and six in the morning. Have you ever been in those hours, three and six in the morning, and woken up, and you're just dealing with something because that's when you've got to deal with, that's when the fear comes in and you can't go back to sleep? Well, in Scripture, there's things that happen in this three to six hour time period. This is what we talked about last week where Jacob wrestled with God before entering into his destiny as Israel. It was this time period that he wrestled. Moses led the Israelites across the Red Sea exodus at this hour. And the angels appeared to the shepherds in the field to announce the birth of Christ at this time. And Jesus is resurrected from the dead during this time. And here Peter walks on the water. And one of the common elements in some of those events is fear. Fear plays out in many of them. When Moses was at the Red Sea, the people were screaming in fear. Why did you bring us out here to die? There's nowhere to go. We're up against the sea and the Egyptian army is coming to kill us. And when the angels appeared to the shepherds, they were fearful, as indicated by the response of the angels who said, fear not. And when Jacob wrestled with God, he was definitely fearful for what his brother's intent was. After all, his brother was coming with 400 men. And see, there's times when we get fearful, we allow our fear to control us. Someone once noted that the opposite of faith is not doubt, but fear. See, I truly believe that doubt is a natural part of our faith. It's in when we doubt and we struggle with that doubt that we grow in our faith as we Go to God in these doubt times. But fear is something else. Fear controls us. It pushes us down. It pushes us away from God. Here's what someone once said about fear. They wrote, it can limit us, defeat us, cause us to fail. It can literally paralyze our lives and cause us to shrink back from achieving our goals. It is fear that keeps us unhappy and dissatisfied with ourselves but unable to cope with the prospect of a meaningful change. It is fear that haunts our marriages, that causes us to stifle growth 
and fulfillment. It is fear that keeps many of us from succeeding in our work. Fear blinds us and binds us as it blinds us to the possibilities and binds us to the safe, sterile lives that we've always lived. Fear produces sleepless nights as we worry about the events over which we have no control. Fear does so much negative stuff to us. And one of the things I've noted in the last few months as we've been dealing with this pandemic is many Christians are fearful today. And we should not be fearful. Careful, yes, but not fearful. Because we should never fear death. Now you can say, I don't want to die today. Most of us are not ready to go to heaven. It's like the little boy said, who wants to go to heaven? And all the kids raise their hand and we'll accept one little boy. And the teacher asks, why? He says, well, I'm not ready to go today. <laughs> That's fine. But we should not fear death. Think about your automobile. How many of you are afraid to get in your automobile and drive? And over my time as a ministry, I've had to deal with many Children saying, mom and dad shouldn't be driving. How can I get the car away from them? Because when you try and take a car away from someone who's getting old, they dig their heels in. They're not fearful about driving. They want to drive. And yet every year, 39,000 people will die from an automobile accident. 4.4 million people every year will be in an automobile accident that will cause them to go to the hospital. And some of those accidents will cause, be so bad that it will change their life forever. And yet, we do not fear driving. That's because we've, we learned, we trained, we stay observant. And we, have, we know that there are people out there who will not be as attentive as we are and will be drunk. But we do not fear them. We prepare for them. And that's the way we need to live our lives, not fearful, but prepared. And Scripture over and over again promises us good things. We must hear these promises and we must live on these promises. When Jesus called out the disciples to not be afraid to take courage because it was him, he was trying to calm them down so they could see what was going on. And I love what Peter, in response to it being Jesus, he makes the absolute craziest request of Jesus to prove it is him. He says, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come out to the water to meet you. Now, of all the things I could think about to say to prove yourself, this is not one of them that would come to my mind. And yet, Jesus simply says, come on. And it's an answer to Peter's request. It's a prayer, if you will. And Peter acted on what he heard. He got up and he responded. But what we notice is that even as we act on God's promises, as, as we respond to what we hear, the world does not stop trying to pull us down. The world does not stop in its screaming at us to get our attention to turn us away from God. And we see this played out as Peter got in the boat. He began to walk to Jesus. But then he began to look at his surrounding circumstances. He looked at the waves, he heard the wind, and he became frightened. See, that's what the world does to us sometimes. It can scare the living daylights out of us. And we focus on it and rather than the promises of Christ. And yet there's a picture in the Bible that tells, as we walk with Christ, as we walk in the promises of God, one promise leads to another promise, which means one blessing leads to another blessing, which leads to another blessing. We see this in Abraham's life because we have enough of his life recorded that we see how as he responded, there were additional promises made and additional blessings. See, the first thing God ever said to Abraham when he was just known as Abram was, leave your land and I'll go show you a land. We find this in Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and curse. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That was his original promise. I'll show you a land and I'll bless you. 
But as Abraham responded and went, he got additional blessings, additional promises. We find later in Genesis 12, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Amor of Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. And so he received a new promise. Or really an additional promise. To your offspring will go this land. And then as he goes down some more, there's an incident where his nephew Lot is captured and taken captive along with his family and all Lot's wealth. And Abraham gathers a group of men to go and to rescue Lot. And after he rescues him and brings him back, he receives another blessing, another promise. We find this in Genesis 14, where God says, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. And as these blessings would come and these promises come, Abraham would finally ask God, Well, how's all this to happen when he does not have a son? And a distant relative is set to inherit all he has. And so he receives another promise and another blessing. We find this in Genesis 15. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. And he took him outside and he said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And so not only will you have offspring, but you are going to have one of your own body and that will lead to countless many's. And it is recorded in scripture that Abram believed the Lord. And when Abram believed, then God laid out his entire plan for Abraham. He began to show him what would happen. And he put Abraham in a deep sleep. And we find this also in Genesis 15. As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I will promise the nation they serve as slaves, but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions, You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Ammonites has not yet reached its full measure. And when the sun had set, a darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. And on this day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, and said to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. And see, we see that as we trust in God's promises and act on them, God gives us more promises and more blessings. I've often wondered what blessing and joy Peter would have received if he had reached Christ, if he had never looked at the waves, if he had gotten to the Christ and the two of them would have hugged, would have laughed, and had a perfect moment. One can imagine the exhilaration. But it didn't happen because Peter focused on something else. But Peter continued to grow in his faith just as Abraham did. And we see that it wasn't always a straight line growth in faith with either of them. And I'm thankful for that because my own life has not been a straight line. Every year I was more faithful than last. I have still had many fits and starts. But I found that the more we trust in God, the more we trust in what God is telling us, the more peace and more blessings we will have in our lives. Everything will not always be right. Everything will not always be the way you want it. But God is always there to bring peace to your life. To give you hope and to bless you. And when we are in those times of failing, Christ is there to reach down to grab us and to pull us up. We might hear a mild word of rebuke, why didn't we believe? But that's just so that we will learn and to grow in our faith. But God's love will never stop. Trust in God's word 
Trust in his promises. As James says in his letter before Nike stole it, just do it. Just hear them and live in them. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you bless us in so many ways. We thank you that you give us so many promises. And the more we walk with you, the more promises we see and the deeper we see them. And the more we walk with you, the blessings just follow blessing. And we learn that in the storms of life, you were there reaching down to grab us, to lift us up, and to love us. We thank you for all these promises. We thank you that we're able to stand on these promises, live on these promises, and grow in these promises. We praise your name. And it's in your son's most precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.